From Washington, D.C., this is a special Your Voice, Your Future, Vote 2014. Your airwaves are undoubtedly flooded with ads. Your inbox begging for campaign cash as if the weight of the world hangs in the balance. And truth is, there is plenty at stake. We get to make a new beginning. The 2014 midterms have escalated into a full-on assault. Mitch, that's not how you hold a gun. The top trophy, control of the U.S. Senate. Kansas will deliver. The questions, will one of its leaders take the helm or lose his job? Can a former Florida Republican turned independent turned Democrat win back his governorship? Does a former Massachusetts maverick now stake his claim in another state? Democrats struggling to hold on. Republicans think they smell blood in the water. Democrats uh, are, as we've talked about before, uh, going to have a, a bad election day. Are candidates keeping distance from President Obama, but gladly raking in cash he helps raise? It's good to be back in Wisconsin. And is it all just a precursor to 2016? Heavy hitters now pounding the pavement and setting the stage. The president! So from Chris Christie to Hillary Clinton. Make sure you get everybody out to vote. Joe Biden to Rand Paul and now even Jeb Bush. Joining our election roundtable discussion, Democratic Congressman Jim Moran of Virginia, former Republican Congressman Tom Davis of Virginia, Washington Post political reporter Sean Sullivan, and from the Washington Times, political reporter Stephen Dynan. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Scott Thuman. We are just five days away from the midterm elections and what could be a major shift in power or an impressive defensive stand by Democrats. We are joined by our esteemed panel to discuss how these elections will shape our government. One of the biggest issues this year is, of course, control of the Congress, specifically the Senate. And right now, Democrats are the majority. But if the Republicans can win just six seats, the GOP will gain control. Let's get right to some of the Senate races that could decide the balance of power. Leon Skolte from Rasmussen Reports joins us from the newsroom. Leon, take it away. What races are you seeing really tighten at this hour? Thank you, Scott. Um, right now, we, we can start with North Carolina. We have new numbers in today that show uh, Kay Hagan has taken a one-point lead, so that race is definitely a toss-up. It looks like it's going to go right down to the wire. Uh, one of the things about North Carolina, our polling shows that the president's approvals, disapprovals are right about even, so he's not as much of a drag as he may be on some other races. And to that effect, we're thinking that the African-American vote uh, may determine that race in North Carolina. If you want, we can move to Georgia. Georgia is an interesting race in the fact that Georgia, if the candidate does receive 50 percent plus one, uh, there will be a runoff on January 6th. Michelle Nunn has pulled into a tie uh, with Purdue in Georgia. So that race, again, is looking like it's going to go down to the wire. And again, it could not be decided possibly until January 6th if neither candidate passes the 50 percent plus one threshold. Another thing about Georgia is the Republicans need to hold that seat, that Saxby Chambliss' seat. Uh, so the Republicans, that's crucial to their efforts as well. Um, in Colorado, we had a toss-up for a while in a neck-and-neck -neck race between Gardner and Udall. Um, Cory Gardner has now pulled out to a six-point lead, so that now he leans Republican in that race. Um, an interesting fact in that race is that the Denver Post, not a conservative paper, actually endorsed uh, Cory Gardner in this year's race as well. If we go to Arkansas, um, another race where we have Tom Cotton uh, with a three-point lead over Mark Pryor, which uh, gives the status of that race as a toss-up. So Cotton and Pryor are neck and neck as well. And if you ask about uh, voters who are certain to vote, Cotton takes a double-digit lead over Pryor. And then in Kentucky, we have Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell has finally passed the 50 percent threshold, and we've moved his race into Lean's Republican. Um, there was some worry that uh, Mitch McConnell's unpopularity nationally would affect that race. However, it might appear that the president is more unpopular in Kentucky than Mitch McConnell, so we are calling that race as Lean's Republican. All right, uh, great update there. We're going to check back in with you throughout the show as we discuss some of these races in greater detail and some of the ones that we haven't gotten to yet, but we've got time. I want to go right to our panel uh, and the overarching question that we are all asking today, and I'm just going to start with you and let's get, uh, get pretty raw with it here. Who's going to win the Senate? It's going to be tough for the Democrats uh, to hold on to the majority. It may be decided in December, possibly in January. 
I'm not sure it makes a whole lot of difference, though, Scott, because Republicans are not going to have enough of a majority to end the filibuster. So I think basically the Senate is going to continue to be a standstill in terms of getting any real legislation passed. But politically, they'll be able to say, hey, we've got the numbers we're trying, we're being stymied, right? It's a, it's a leverage point for them well, to some degree, right? And, and speaking of leverage, you've got a number of independents now who mm -hmm. I think are going to be able to uh, have a, a lot of leverage, uh, particularly if Orman uh, beats Roberts. Right, Orman has yet to say who he would caucus with, so that would be a question mark there. Uh, Congressman, some people are calling this the most wide open Senate election in a decade. You crunch numbers all the time yourself. What do you think? Well, it's advantage Republicans. This is fought on a Republican playing field. If you take a look at the seats that are up this time, uh, seven of them are, in, are Democratic seats are in states that Romney carried in, in not a particularly good year. So the Republicans don't need a wave. They just need to run the table on the seats that are rightfully theirs. Gentlemen, can they run the table? Yeah, so absolutely. Well, run the table might be tough, but they can certainly win a number of these seats that the Congressman Davis was just talking about that should rightfully be theirs. Look, I think the overriding thing that's happening here is a return to, if you look at states, you look at what states Romney won versus Obama won, a lot of these small conservative states that should properly normally be turning two Republican senators to, uh, to the Senate, a lot of them have one Democrat, some of them have two Democrats. And what we're seeing in places like West Virginia, uh, Montana, uh, South Dakota, in particular, the three where Democrats haven't even made much of an effort to hold on to seats there, you're seeing that return happen. You're seeing a, a retrenchment to normal Republican lines. So the last six, maybe eight years, when you had an anti-Bush wave and then you had the pro-Obama wave, those are starting to recede. And maybe more importantly, Republicans have gotten out of their way in a number of those races where they used to be stumbling and putting up bad candidates. So, uh, you know, run the table will be tough, but they should be able to take a number of those seats that, you know, by demographics should rightfully be theirs. Sean Sullivan, you uh, eat, breathe, live this stuff over the Washington Post. Talk to me about what surprises you or what race are you most excited about? We've got some sexy races out there when you look at what's happening in New Hampshire, when you look at uh, Iowa and Kansas. I mean, there's plenty to talk about. What do you love? Well, I think the unexpected ones are the best. I mean, nobody going into this election cycle thought Kansas was going to be a competitive race, but here we are less than a week before the election. Pat Roberts has been clawing his way back. He's been bringing, you know, virtually every big name Republican into the state to campaign for him, and he's really in a 50-50 race right now against Greg Orman, and as you guys pointed out earlier, we don't know who Greg Orman is going to caucus with if he's elected to the Senate, and so, you know, you have a situation where if the majority comes down to him, this independent, this former Republican and Democrat, all of a sudden becomes the most interesting man in politics, really, for the next couple of months. What does that mean if, if Greg Orman wins? Uh, not necessarily uh, numbers-wise in the Senate. Well, but what wins, does it say? He, well, he'll move from the Republicans' bet noir into their best friend of uh, the next couple <laughs> months as they court him is what it will mean. Sure. If he wants a future, he's going to have to caucus uh, with the Republican Party. But what does it say overall about the state of politics right now? I mean, you look at the poll numbers, and well, we always... Well, people aren't happy. They aren't happy with their choices. They aren't happy with either party. But they only get two or sometimes three choices on Election Day. And what they do is, is when one party gets in, they overcorrect and go the other route not because they're electing the other party, uh, but they're just trying to balance government. Look, this tells you how bad things are in, in some ways for Democrats, but for Washington as a whole. The Democrats' best chance of keeping control of the Senate rests with independents at this point. You know, Orman, it looks like the uh, challenge from the independent in South Dakota has faded somewhat, but for a while there you had uh, a number of independents in particular. If uh, third party candidates or independents can send Louisiana and Georgia races into overtime, so to speak, you know, then we'll have a, a national fight in those two states. Those are the Democrats' best hopes for keeping the majority rests with being able to send those races into overtime and, and putting a lot of effort there and having Orman win and wooing him in Kansas. Congressman Moran, a lot of what you have seen is since 1991 now, right, in office. And of course, we have to, to note for those who aren't familiar, Congressman Moran is uh, stepping down from his coveted spot over here and representing Northern Virginia, a really important district. Um, the level of discontent, the level of fighting with which you watch daily up there on the Hill has grown to a point that a lot of people are apathetic or they're angry. Now, what we see in some of these campaigns is that people don't go to the polls when they're content or they're uninvolved. When they're angry, sometimes they go. Are people so disgruntled that that is completely driving the needle in this campaign? Well, I think it depends on who is going to vote. I don't think you're going to have a terribly accurate reflection of the entire electorate. You know, when the founding fathers established the country, it was only 
white guys that own 25 acres or more of land who voted, they still tend to be the ones who vote uh, in off-year elections uh, uh, disproportionately. I, I think it's going to be very difficult for the Democrats to get uh, enough women, particularly single women, out voting, uh, 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 let alone minorities, and, uh, and you'll probably see even fewer uh, young people voting. And so that's the principal Democratic stronghold. Uh, there, the, I, I have to say that uh, the Democrats have raised a lot of money. They may be able to get uh, have a decent get out the vote, but it's really about who votes, uh, and uh, and I think that probably favors the uh, Republicans. It certainly has historically in off-year elections. Yeah, so Mid-years are always about the president and their level of popularity. The only three times in the last 150 years has the president's party picked up seats in the House. If you look at the presidential popularity in those years, they were off the chart. President Obama, I saw in one poll, is down to 39 percent. That's just not a good portent for a mid-year election climate. And it's the angrier people, the people that are upset with the status quo, upset with the president. And that's 51 percent, the people who are angry or do disapprove Correct. of his work right now. And, of course, Congress also with a tough disapproval rating. We see that all the time. We've got that up on the screen for well, you. Look but at the governor's races. So you're having some Republican governors in real trouble, in the sure. Democratic incumbents in trouble, again, looking at that public And that's a barometer, isn't it? Correct. But also what I think is a fascinating barometer, and let's go back in time just a tiny bit here, because I think that it kind of uh, portends what we're going to see perhaps on Tuesday is what happened with Eric Cantor's seat. I don't think there was any bigger surprise in the world of politics this year than Eric Cantor losing that seat. Now we've got two professors on a college campus duking it out, neither with political experience. One of them is going to take a seat that was once uh, one of the most coveted out there. Of course, you lose that seat in leadership. But uh, w what does that say when you have Jack Trammell and Dave Bratt going at it uh, and debating on a college campus for their 1,300 students? Well, basically, it's a vote of, for none of the above uh, when you have two unknowns, uh, college professors that have been uh, sort of disengaged up till now. Uh, it, you know, I'll tell you a little story. We were getting a briefing from the military uh, on Afghanistan, and they were reassuring us that the Taliban can't take control of the country. They're, they're only at about 16, 17 percent approval rating. And we were saying, oh, well, that, uh, that's a relief. And then it occurred to all of us, hey, wait a minute. That's a whole lot better than we are. <laughs> uh, we <laughs> we give anything. Your 14% was well, eclipsed by the Taliban. Uh, uh, well, exactly. And, and we'd do anything to be up to 39% where the president is. So I don't think it's just the president. I do think there's a disaffection throughout the country for government generally. Do we agree? Is the House at all in jeopardy or no? No. no. Not no. at all. No one. I mean, think of the way that you have the, the three different uh, you know, governorships and then your two uh, houses of Congress. Uh, the governorships are the ones where Democrats have the best chance to uh, make, maybe even make gains, at the very least hold their own. That's an area where they're running independently of President Obama's record. You take the House, not much has happened in the last two years, maybe the last four years, six years in, uh, it, well, I guess you would give Obamacare in the first two years when President Obama had total control. Ever since I left. Right. <laughs> <laughs> ever since Congressman Davis but decided to get out. Nothing's happened. If you right? look at the last four years, there's not much record for either the Senate or the House to run on. So essentially, they're running in the environment that President Obama created for them, which is why Democrats are suffering there. Each of the, the executives, the chief executives, the governors, they have an independent record to run on. And that's why you're actually seeing competitive races. You're seeing uh, places where uh, Democratic strongholds like Illinois, where the Democratic governor's in trouble, and you're seeing Republican strongholds like Kansas, where the Republican governor's in trouble because they have independent records. It would be nice to see Congress create a record to actually take to voters next time around. Uh, Sean, they were talking about possibly 63 seats in the House uh, in 2010 were gained by the GOP. Uh, we probably won't see that number this time around, but does any significant gain by the GOP in the House mean anything? Not really in terms of the legislation, um, but you know, part of the reason we're not going to see those kind of gains is because Republicans were so successful last time and there aren't really as many battlegrounds, uh, as many swing districts for them to make gains. Right now, when you talk to Republican and Democratic strategists, they sort of generally agree that uh, Republicans are on pace to gain anywhere from five to 12 seats. The head of the Republicans' campaign arm has said, look, we want to get to 245. At the end of the day, Republicans are going to have their majority in the House. Um, they're going to continue to hold it. Uh, really what matters is the Senate and that's why we're seeing all the focus and really all the money uh, head toward those Senate races. It should be said though, Scott, that there will be some change I think within the Republican caucus. 
because there are, are, are going to be more Tea Party anti-government uh, type members representing the Republican Party. So I do think you'll see a, a shift in, in priorities within the caucus. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to see a whole lot of change in the, in the total numbers. I think you'll probably see one or two African-American Republicans in the House caucus this time, one or two openly gay Republican members of the caucus. I think slowly it's diversifying The face of the party well. changing. And let me just say, 2010, the, the districts aren't the same as they were in 2010 because you went through redistricting, but what the Republicans use their opportunity in redistricting is to strengthen their weak seats. And you're, you know, you're right, there just aren't that many seats that are on the table anymore. In the most competitive year you could think of now, you're going to have less than 20 percent of the House seats are in jeopardy for, for, uh, for both parties combined. Congressman Moran, you mentioned the Tea Party, and I, I want to bring up, as we get ready to go back to Leon Skolte from Rasmussen Reports in the newsroom here, uh, the Tea Party, at least one faction of the Tea Party, finally coming out and endorsing uh, Pat Roberts in Kansas because they felt that it was time to step up in that race. They, they're greatly concerned they could lose that, and they said anything's better than a Democrat, even though they had bashed him quite handily in the primary, uh, saying he didn't represent them and he was lost to Washington ways. Leon, what do we see out of Kansas that, that you think is interesting? Well, you, you hit it on the head. Um, Pat Roberts came out of the primary bloodied up by, by a Tea Party challenger. And what we see nationally is when we poll Republican voters, about two-thirds of Republican voters don't believe that the Republican Party represents their values, and they believe that their congressman is out of touch with them. The problem for the Republicans is about a third of them think that their congressman is too liberal, and another third thinks their congressman is too conservative. So I think what we're seeing in Pat Roberts is that problem within the Republican Party. Um, he is closing the gap. As somebody said, they're, they're bringing in um, some of the big hitters from the party. But right now, Pat Roberts is only getting 66 percent of the vote amongst Republican voters, and Greg Orman is getting about 31 percent. So there's not necessarily the allegiance from your constituents just because you have the R or the D in front of your name we anymore. But have a controversial governor's race there, where the Republican governor That's what I was just going to say. Let's go to Florida. He did, it, and it, but in Kansas, the Republican did a purge of moderate Republicans that didn't support his, his tax policy. So you have a revolt within the party that is certainly going to hurt in the governor's race, and it seems to be carrying on some, some collateral damage in the Senate race. Okay, one of the most entertaining governor's races out there is in the Sunshine State. And of course, politics are never dull in Florida. There's always some sort of problem, whether it be a hanging check. Or, or, or beyond that. Uh, Rick Scott trying to hold on against Charlie Chris, who was a Republican governor, turned independent, now turned Democrat. You're, are we laughing inside at this race, or do we think this is just... I'm just happy I'm not having to watch the ads down there. I mean, it's, it's such a slugfest, and neither guy is, uh, is anywhere near approaching popularity with the voters. It's, it's, you know, I, I, it's a very important decision to make, but I'm glad I wouldn't have to vote there. No, I agree. I mean, it's it's close. A lot of money is being spent here. Everybody knows what the race is about. They don't like their choices on here. Ultimately, it's the race is, uh, you know, about the incumbent. And here you have two incumbents, and neither of which are very popular. Can we talk about the president for a minute? And let's bring him into the fold here. President Obama, obviously, uh, not with the poll numbers he'd like to be. Not that he's, uh, at this point in his term, obviously, he's still higher than George W. Bush was, but significantly lower than Clinton than we saw with Ronald Reagan. Um, People are happy to take the cash he raises, but they don't necessarily want him on the dais next to them holding hands in the air. If you were running for re-election, not in the stronghold of Northern Virginia, if you were in Kansas, if you were in Iowa, would you want President Obama on stage with you, Congressman Moran? I don't think it would necessarily help, but I think I'd have him on stage if he wanted to do it. I don't think he would do it. He, he's more pragmatic than that. Uh, I, I do th think, though, that uh, when Alison Lundigan Grimes uh, disavowed, the, I mean, she wouldn't acknowledge who she voted say for. Who she voted for in the past. I, I mean, that she did, she came off as less than authentic. I, I mean, if you if you want to be a political leader, you've got to be able to, to answer questions definitively. Uh, you know, she could have just said, uh, "I'm a Democratic candidate. I voted for the Democratic nominee, and let it be." But uh, uh, I think that probably hurt her. I, I think when people. Uh, disavow the president. It doesn't make them look very good. Uh, I, I think in, in Georgia, though, uh, it, Michelle Nunn, I, th I think, is going to uh, have a real good chance of winning that seat. Of course, uh, you know, her father ran uh, when George McGovern was at the top of the ticket, uh, lost by 50 points, but her father won as a Democratic Senate candidate. So uh, it, it, some of this 
uh, association with the president, it, it, it doesn't matter uh, as much if you're a strong, authentic candidate. People feel they, they know you. You know, um, I don't want to belabor this, but uh, Tip O'Neill, obviously, uh, uh, there was a lot of truth when he said all politics is local, but basically all politics is personal. People need a personal, feel a personal relationship with these candidates. I, I, I don't think they feel that as, as much anymore. And, and, and uh, while President Obama has a lot of supporters, loyalists within uh, the Congress, I'm not sure how many personal relationships that he has. I, I, and I think there's a perception and there's some uh, justification for it that he's a, he's a bit removed from it. When, when we talk about the Congress not being effective, some of that is because, uh, you know, I'll, I'll use a dirty word, uh, earmarks. The president says anything that's the, that has an earmark in it, I'm going to veto. Well, every spending bill Everything is earmarked. Does. It depends upon who does the earmarking. But when he does those things uh, that are not helpful to the Congress, I mean, President Lincoln couldn't have gotten emancipation through <laughs> if he wasn't able to do some trading. And, sure. and so there is a sense that the president is a little disengaged with the Congress, and, and I'm not sure how, how much of a personal relationship they feel towards him vis-a-vis -vis somebody like Bill Clinton, for example. Congress, you talk, talk right. about another race we're going to be watching very closely on Tuesday night. That's Louisiana Senate race. It's another one that we couldn't end up not knowing. No, that'll go into overtime. We're going to go to a runoff on that, and then that's what, December right. December 6th. Landrieu has won two overtimes before, mm -hmm. but I think it's different this time. They, those were pre, you know, Why Katrina. is this one different? Well, I think they're going to have turnout problems, so, and you're going to find out that the other uh, people on the ticket are more conservative than the Republican nominee. So when you put it all together, it, it's going to be a tough uh, December election for her. I know she would like to win it the first time out. I think the same in Georgia. I think Democrats have a harder time in this environment getting their votes out. Uh, they have been meticulous about organizing and everything else, but trying to put it back to back gets very, very difficult. And Republicans will still be angry and easier to get out to vote. As I recall, Saxby Chambliss, I believe, went to a runoff uh, six years ago and, of course, won it in the... Uh, in the uh, extra election as well. So Republicans, Landrieu has those victories, but it, I, I agree with the congressman, the environment is better for Republicans in those runoffs this year. Unless, uh, you know, if control of Congress is already decided, or the Senate's already decided in favor of Republicans, you might see a little bit of a correction one race or the other. But. And what about the president's executive orders? Those can inflame, they're more likely to inflame the people that, that are the losers. Uh, you know, the people that are the losers in these things tend to be the angry, not the people that get rewarded. So again, that's likely to rebound the Republicans in those states. What about, uh, let's talk about, and we'll bring in Leon Skolte again in a second here from Rasmussen Reports. What about New Hampshire? I think New Hampshire is a fascinating race. You've got Scott Brown. Of course, he, he has that very short special election term after the death of Ted Kennedy. Uh, he very quickly gets ousted by a, a liberal a voting tough base. It's state to poll because you have same-day registration. Mm -hmm. And so many times they have missed it. But I think what is going on up there is you're seeing the same national trend we're seeing is that you have a more generic Republican ballot. And that uh, seems to be affecting it. That works in his favor, though, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think like a, only a third of New Hampshire voters were, uh, were born in New Hampshire now. They, it, these are very transient states. It's not like it used to be in Scott yeah. Brown. Uh, it's poll. a purple state. And there are a lot of people living in New Hampshire because it has lower taxes than right. Massachusetts does, but they're really Bay Staters. Uh, and right. so it's not that big a deal that he's running in another state because there are so many people that were lived in Massachusetts that have moved but to But he's tried to nail him on essentially being a reverse carpetbagger, right? You mean this yeah. in this kind of the... Yeah. the yeah. But when half the state are carpetbaggers... <laughs> uh, <laughs> excuse this me. Is, this is an example of a race, I think, where, you know, the president really right. is dragging down the incumbent. Jean Shaheen is somebody who has natural popularity. She was governor. People generally like her, but as her numbers have fallen. What we've seen is Obama's numbers have really fallen in New Hampshire. And Scott Brown, as much as any Republican candidate in the country right now, his entire campaign is based on pointing to the times that Shaheen voted for the Obama agenda and tethering her to the president. And, you know, the, that's how he's been able to pull to, you know, almost within even right now okay. after being down, you know, five points a few months ago. Well, then let's ask Leon Skolte down in the newsroom with Rasmussen Reports what we're seeing number wise out of New Hampshire. Leon? Well, number-wise, what we're seeing, we still have uh, Shaheen up out of the margin of error uh, with Scott Brown. But I agree with what we're seeing, what we heard. He has pulled closer, and he is tying um, Shaheen closely with the president. So with Scott Brown, he, it, candidates matter. I believe that he's indicative of that. And you hear a lot of uh, talk that he's a strong closer. So if there's enough time, and if you believe Scott Brown is the Mariano Rivera of political candidates, <laughs> there is time for him. But 
that remains to be seen. All right, sports analogy is always helpful in this scenario. Let's talk one more governor's race because those sometimes are a litmus test for what's happening around the nation. Uh, but Texas is always its own entity. It's a good race going on down there, isn't it? Anyone want to jump in on that? Yeah, it is. You know, uh, Wendy Davis, the Democratic nominee, got a lot of attention early on in this election cycle. Uh, but really, this is a, still a very Republican state. And Greg Abbott, from day one, has really been the favorite in this race. Um, you know, it's, it's been nasty at times. But look, you know, Democrats have talked uh, for a while about trying to turn Texas purple or eventually blue. They're not there yet, and they're not going to get there in this election cycle. One number to look at in that on election night will be what uh, percentage of the Hispanic vote Abbott gets. There's a very good chance he could get near a majority or even a majority. And if that's true, then it really does put the nail in the coffin of turning Texas uh, blue or purple anytime soon. We've got just a couple minutes left. Their voter ID law was upheld, too, by the Supreme Court. Right, which, which was very significant. We've got just a couple minutes left. I want to ask you, uh, Congressman Davis, as we talk about something that I read Rand Paul the other day saying about the Republican Party, uh, your party here saying, quote, the Republican Party brand sucks. I mean, those are his words, yet you still look like you're going to have a good night Tuesday night. Well, they're not going to get elected on who they are. They're going to get elected because of who they aren't. Yeah. And right now, they're not the incumbent party in the White House, and that's what the midterms tend to be about. What are the surprises on Tuesday night? Anyone? Hmm. Uh, well, that's a tough one. <laughs> I, 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 you know, it, it's tough to, to pick surprises. I, I, I think Michelle Nunn pulls it out. Uh, I, I think Sh Shaheen wins in New Hampshire. Um, Mitch McConnell's uh, fine in Kentucky. Uh, McConnell's uh, probably going to win in, in Kentucky. Uh, Begich probably loses in Alaska right now. Uh, I, I don't see a whole lot of surprise. There are some interesting races, uh, frankly, in places like California, where you've got uh, some new incumbents uh, that are in tough races. They're putting a lot of money in both parties, uh, but uh, I don't think we can uh, we can predict what the outcome is going to be there. You're going to see governorships flip in red states going blue and blue states. It's going red. Look at New England. Republicans have really a good shot in Connecticut, a good shot in Massachusetts at this point, uh, where they hold in Maine. But these tend to be a little more localized races. But I think we're going to see some some outcroppings there, where blue is voting red and red is voting blue in the government. Twenty seconds, Sean. I think if there is a surprise, is that Republicans do better than forecasts in the House. They've, they've been trying to put uh, some really Democratic seats in play lately, spending money in districts that Democrats are trying to hold. So uh, it's really up to the DCCC to, to hold those seats right now. Stephen. I got no surprises. I'm just waiting for it. No? Maybe the surprises will end up with a split of 50-50. Joe Biden gets to run in at the last minute and <laughs> be the king of the Senate, as he's always dreamed. Listen, uh, thank you so much. Very insightful. Appreciate it. The number is great uh, because it means that we do have possibly up to 10 races that are worth really focusing on. Six that could be very late nights for all of us, too. We may not decide until December, possibly beyond that with runoffs. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you to uh, our numbers cruncher, Leon Skolte from Rasmussen Reports tonight. We appreciate your time as well. That is all the time we have for tonight, but hardly the end of this discussion. Much more here on WJLA News Channel 8 and your local stations. We'll see you Tuesday night as well.